Hello, hello, hello. Welcome to WebSleuth YouTube Live. I got to check this again. We accidentally had our live stream listed uh, and unlisted, and it <laughs> now is in public. I'll tell you what, let me just double check and make sure on my end, because we weren't getting anybody in chat, and we're like, wah, 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 wah. And then um, I just thought I better check, and it was put under unlisted meaning you guys couldn't see it unless we gave it to you so let me just check this really quickly here i've got my other youtube account see if i can see it okay there we go Oh, good. We've got somebody. Yay. Yeah. Woo uh, Persephone's pomegranate. We're going to wait just a little bit because I accidentally had it on unlisted, meaning you guys couldn't see it, even though we were promoting the hell up. Now, if you send them the link, they had the link, you know, but uh, yeah. yeah. But I got to go grab something real quick, guys. Can you chat, chat amongst yeah. yourselves for just a moment? I'm going to take myself off of the uh, video too. So I'll be right back. Okay. Hello everyone, Marlene, Miss Wee Lassie, Stardust Serenade, Dr. Vonda Kay, Beth Serrano, uh, Lindsay Dolber, Dolber, I'm not sure if I'm saying that properly. <laughs> so, hi everyone. This will be a good show. Hey Tracy, haven't seen you in a while. The doctor's back in the house. Uh, Persephone, yeah, it's we all need that sometimes, I think. I needed one today, so I had told my husband, just take me shopping for a while so I can just get out of the house and not think about anything else. And that's what I did. I love that, the house of Slytherin. <laughs> I have been re-watching all the Harry Potter movies again. So yes, I'm 49 and I'm obsessed with Harry Potter and I don't care. So. <laughs> yeah, Catherine Ramslin is great. Oh, I'm sorry, Tracy. That's a bummer. Yeah, me too, Amber. I am rewatching movies and I'm listening. I read all the books to my kids years ago, but at night to help me sleep, I've got all the books on Audible. And so right now I'm made it to Order of the Phoenix. So I listen to the books at night when I lay down to go to sleep. So, and it, it really helps me sleep. My the Thoris. Hey, I'm so sorry, Tracy. That's awful. Hi, England from California. Elaine Tolling. I don't have an Xbox, but we bought the Hogwarts Legacy on PlayStation, but they had it out and then they took it back. So we're waiting for it to come out again so we can get, we paid for it already though. No, Tracy, just in joy. You're not a downer. That's terrible, especially around the holidays. As everything seems harder when things like that happen on the holidays. My son, my youngest son, Pat, <coughs> excuse me, passed away on my grandfather's birthday. That was pretty depressing too. So the holidays and birthdays, it's, I don't know, it's worse for some reason. All right, is the gang all here? 
Almost. Yeah. Good, good. No, I, I said you. that right. Yeah. Sorry my, about that. Okay. Wait, I need to correct something. I think I said it in reverse. My grandfather. Wait. What? The my grandfather you know? passed away on my son's birthday. I think I said it in reverse. Oh, that's So scary. I had to correct that real quick. Yes, Sorry. please. Correct that. correct that quickly, quickly. Sorry. Oh, and yeah. I don't want that. And I even forgot, not forgot, but been putting on my makeup here. But hey. Here's the deal. We interviewed Dr. Catherine Ramsland. Now, her credentials are, are phenomenal. In fact, hold on. I, I can't even begin to read them all to you. Uh, she's a criminologist. She's, you know, a professor. She's written a million books. But the one that everybody knows is the BTK killer. She spent a lot of time with him, with Dennis Rader. And uh, she does talk about that actually quite a bit toward the end, but she is such a, a um, professional and is a, such a classy, smart woman. And you can see in the beginning, I'm absolutely terrified. Really, I'm afraid that she's going to kick me out of class, call my parents and fail me. That's, <laughs> how, that's how the interview starts. But um, anyway, and that's all on me because I was so, she's not intimidating at all. She's very kind and sweet and polite, but I was very intimidated just because of her her knowledge and and her ab ability to you know uh, put things together. Now, the other thing she is known for is when uh, Brian Kohlberger was arrested, the guy that uh, did the the Idaho crime. A lot of people thought that for some reason Brian was her student. And I can't remember how that got going. Do, do, do you know Insightful One? He was in Pennsylvania. When she was and teaching? Yeah. Okay. And I don't know, again, somehow somebody connected that that was Brian's teacher. And all she has said is she is not commenting on Brian Kohlberger. And so we didn't even bring it up or anything. So that's why. And I sure if I would have brought it up, she would have failed me and called my parents. So oh, I was about to do that. But anybody, uh, not anybody, everybody, I am so glad you're here. This interview is about, let me check here. What, 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 whoops, wrong one, wrong one. No, stop. Where'd it go? Hold on. Okay. Wait a minute. I'm getting the wrong one here. Whoa, wait, something's wrong, guys. Just a second. Just a second. Talk amongst yourselves, please. Okay, I'm here. We're here. Okay. Um, Okay, I'm going to remove me for a minute because I have to do some technical stuff here and see what's going on, and I'll be right back, okay? All right. Yep, Marlene Clausen, I agree. I didn't even want to ask her anything about that because, I mean, it's, it's an active investigation. It hasn't even gone to court yet, so I didn't think that's even appropriate you know <laughs> I love Trisha and technical stuff Yeah, the Thoris, it has a different feeling when you're here during the day. We've done a few shows during the day, but I guess since Trisha started, but not too many. Well, she used to do one um, during the day and then one at night.
the frogs are good. They're quiet right now. They get noisy at nighttime. And yes, I'm sitting right now. I'm sitting in my backyard at the patio table and the ponds, you know, five feet away from me. And that's where they all live. So. Okay, everybody, we are good to go. Um, the interview is about 54 minutes long. And then uh, we'll come back and have a little chit chat after. Okay, so I'm going to remove us from the screen. Uh, insightful one and we'll be putting up your comments while you're listening okay so let me get the share button here that's not it i know baby i know we're gonna let you out in a minute okay one quick thing. Welcome to WebSluice YouTube Live. My name is Tricia Griffith. And of course, we have with us our incredible executive producer, insightful one, Stacy. We kind of interchange her names back and forth. And the incredible woman on screen with us is Dr. Catherine Ramsland. And Dr. Ramsland, thank you so much for joining us today. We all really appreciate it. Oh, thank you for having me. I'm glad to be here. Now, uh, I'm, I'm getting this off of your um, DeSales uh, website, because that is where you teach. You're an assistant uh, provost professor. Uh, you teach forensic psychology, and uh, you created the forensic track in the psychology program and assisted to create the online master's of arts degree in the criminal justice. You've appeared in more than 200 crime documentaries. You went incredibly deep into the BTK uh, uh, killer's life and story. You have uh, over, what did you say? 70 books. Yes. Out there. <laughs> I, I, you've done so as so many amazing things that we could just spend the, the whole hour listing them. Uh, but you have um, an MFA from DeSales University. You have an MA, Criminal Justice DeSales, uh, MA, Forensic Psychology, John Jay College of Criminal Justice, PhD in Psychology, uh, MA, Clinical Psychology, uh, BA, Psychology, Philosophy. Like I said, the list goes on and on. I am, I, I'm so impressed. I just know I'm going to mess this whole thing up because, my God, you've done so many things. I, I'm I'm in awe. So thank you for joining yeah. us tonight. Um, Dr. Ramson, one thing that we wanted to do on this channel is we wanted to introduce our subscribers to other cases because today true crime has become, and become entertainment and it really is not entertainment. But the big popular cases that explodes, everybody wants to know about them and that's understandable. But true crime has been around since the beginning of time. And since there are so many older cases that are fascinating and that can show us the human behavior before all of these big, huge cases exploded uh, in, in our lifetime, I want to show everybody that these types of cases existed long before we were born. And one of the cases that, that you can tell us about and explain, try and explain the best you can is a serial killer named Albert Fish. Now, Albert Fish came on. Whoops. Oh, is that your phone? Not mine. Uh, not mine. I don't know who that. Uh, that was weird. Anyway, I apologize. Um, Albert Fish was from the early 20s. And there might be people out there going, gosh, that sounds familiar. Well, he was a sick, twisted man. And uh, he would kill children and then cannibalize them but that's just too simple of a way to describe it so dr ramsland can you describe to us albert fish and who he was and what he did well albert fish was a very complicated person uh, probably what we would call uh, ambulatory schizophrenic uh, these days and in, in that he was psychotic but passably functional Mm -hmm. So that, you know, even though he was hospitalized a few times, he was always let go as somebody who could, you know, he had six kids to support. He barely supported them, but he did. Um, but he was a very deviant type of person. He 
suffered from a number of perversions, sexual perversions, mostly because he had a very active fantasy life. He had an obsession with religion. And uh, much of what he read in the Bible, he would kind of scramble to justify and frame the kinds of things he was doing both to himself and to kids. He probably molested an estimated at least 100 kids in 23 different states because he would move around a lot. Every time he got into trouble, he'd move around to someplace else. Um, he formed uh, a plan on how to molest kids that he thought would not really command much in the way of police resources. So he mm -hmm. usually looked for um, black children, Hispanic children, anyone who he thought the police wouldn't really investigate. Mm -hmm. um, and and he was he'd use all kinds of ways to fool people, to dupe people into thinking he was a you know a sweet old man and then he would exploit that and end up committing these crimes, these horrific crimes against kids. And we'll show a picture during this uh, interview of Fish. And you will think he's just this sweet little old man who would do nothing wrong. What I find interesting is that uh, he was diagnosed with schizophrenia back in the early 20s. But it's not like the diagnoses and the treatments that we have today, obviously. Uh, what would be the criteria for a schizophrenic to be diagnosed like that? And what would they do for them back in the 20s? Well, it was um, a man named uh, Dr. Wortham, Frederick Wortham, who diagnosed him. He, he was a psychiatrist uh, in New York. And when Fish was arrested and brought in, he was evaluated both by the prosecution and defense before going to trial. And Wortham evaluated him as was one of the few actually who evaluated him as a psychotic individual who did not really understand what he was doing. Um, although it's, it's pretty clear he did understand what he was doing. Mm -hmm. I should probably first say that there's a difference between psychosis and insanity. Okay. Insanity is a legal term. And it's a term that talks about um, that, that the criteria are whether you have a mental disease or defect such that you don't understand that what you're doing is wrong, mm -hmm. or even if you do, you can't stop yourself from doing it. So that's sort of a cognitive idea of insanity. And there were psychotic people who could still be considered sane mm -hmm. because even though they're, they have a sort of an alter reality, they understand that what they're doing is wrong. And that would be true of Albert Fish, whose, whose actual first name was Hamilton, um, but he didn't like using Hamilton, um, so he preferred Albert. He would fit in that category of people who suffered from uh, a, a psychotic state of mind, but who did understand what would happen to them if they were caught doing the things they were doing. So he would actually be sane uh, as the legal term mm -hmm. holds. And that's often confusing for people to understand. But so Frederick Wortham, who is the psychiatrist, the diagnosing psychiatrist on the defense, thought that he really didn't understand the nature of what he was doing because he threaded so much of it through religious notions. Um, he put himself through a lot he was, well, Wortham uh, described 18 different paraphilias that Fish had. And paraphilias are deviant psychological preferences or practices where he can only be aroused by doing them. And on the list are things like he was a sadist, he was a masochist, he would um, take a, a nail um, paddle and drive it into his, paddle himself with it. He yeah. would stick needles into his uh, groin and testicles. Um, he was a pedophile. Uh, he would um, sometimes consume feces or urine, uh, cannibalism. He, two of the kids he claimed to have cooked into a stew and consumed them while in a state of arousal. Um, he was an exhibitionist. He was a voyeur. He had so he had so many different kinds of deviances, and Wortham said he had never seen so many in one person. 
Mm -hmm. and, and so he was trying to show that these deviances supported the notion that Fish was psychotic, but in fact, they don't, because what we know about paraphilias today, as extreme as they might get, do not really um, take away from the from the person's cognitive awareness uh, mm -hmm. that what they're doing is wrong. So, and that would be true of Fish. So, I think even today, despite having schizophrenia and mm -hmm. and and a whole legacy of it, and from his family. He did understand that what he was doing, there were clearly ways that he could stop himself because he, he described one when he was leading a 13 year old boy out that he was going to castrate and murder. There was too much traffic. So he left. So clearly he had some control over his behavior. Right. He certainly understood what it would mean if he were caught. Um, and he did a lot of things like using other names. Uh, pseudonyms so that people did were not able to track him. Uh, so I, I think he would fit into that category of people who were um, psychotic but functional and certainly aware that what they were doing was against the law and there were consequences. And and he could comprehend that and change his behavior to make sure he didn't get caught. Yes. So therefore, he was not crazy. What I find surprising hearing all of this is that back in the early 20s, that they recognized these things, that that uh, these types of behaviors were given names. I, I didn't realize they were that far along. Oh, they were they were doing that 100 years earlier. Really? In fact, yeah. The asylums in France were trying to categorize some of the mental illnesses that were coming into. So they, they were called alienists at the time, not psychiatrists, yeah. but they were... Yeah. They by the mid nineteenth um, century, they were they had established professional journals where they could speak back and forth about different conditions, and they had recognized psychopathy as a different type of mental disorder than something like schizophrenia. Uh, so yeah, they already had lots of categories for these before the twentieth century. So and remember, Freud. Freud was in a lot of that. Well, he, Freud was, and in fact, Wortham talked, it's called a psychodynamic approach or interpretation. And um, certainly in the 1920s and 30s, when we're talking about Wortham doing these, this analysis, yeah, he's definitely a Freudian. He, he right. talks a lot about the psychodynamic, um, you know, issues that, that Fish had. But this is also when they they were naming and trying to understand schizophrenia, but they did not understand it as a biological disorder, mm -hmm. and that that came mm -hmm. along, you know, decades later. But right. they did understand that it was a dysfunction and prevented a person from really being able to control themselves or to really understand, uh, to be able to process reality in the way most people did. So he. So Wortham tried to make the case that Fish did not belong in a prison. He should not be executed. He should be studied. He should be put into a psychiatric facility. But he had been put into psychiatric facilities several times, mm -hmm. and they didn't find that they needed to keep him. And this was in the days when they could keep people for long periods of time if they wanted to. And they they declined to do this. They didn't find anything you know, particular wrong with him, except that he was just a strange little guy. And that's because Fish knew how to play the game. He knew how to do people. And that would suggest he certainly understood that what he was doing was wrong. Exactly. And so, he would move yeah. around a lot as well. He moved and that around would make all it the time. Incredibly difficult for the police to track him. I mean, they you know, obviously back in the, the early 20s. But let's go back to the beginning because Albert Fish if I understand correctly, was not born this way. Were they able to go back and examine his childhood to understand why he became all of these, these things and, and had all these deviant behaviors? Well, it wouldn't be possible to say he wasn't born this way without doing some kind of brain scan, which mm -hmm. we don't have any way to do at this point. Um, so that's, it's not possible to say he didn't have any kind of predisposition inborn uh, traits, but it, but we do know that when um, his father 
was out of the home and and his mother put him into an orphanage mm -hmm. um, he got aroused when he saw uh i guess i don't know it was a nun maybe spanking boys and she'd spank them on their bare bottom and then and he got aroused when she'd spank him on his bare bottom so this is the beginning of what we call a fetish um where an arousal mechanism is paired with a environmental stimulus and that becomes one of the things that he is completely fascinated with and even obsessed by mm -hmm. is um buttocks that's that's what he wanted whenever he was with children is he wanted to cut off the meaty parts of their of their backsides and cut them up and cook them into a stew and that all came probably came from those early experiences in the orphanage with the spankings and him mm -hmm. watching other boys getting disciplined and him and him finding it not not scary but arousing so different mm -hmm. people process things in different ways. And, right. and some people would be indifferent. Some people would just avoid the punishment. Some people, like Fish, found it arousing. Some people would find it frightening. Um, in his case, he, it became uh, the hallmark of his fantasy life as he started becoming, a, you know, entering into puberty, becoming a young man. But he still hold, held it. Uh, pretty much in abeyance in terms of his fantasy life. He got married. Mm -hmm. uh, he had six children with this particular woman. That mm -hmm. marriage lasted almost two decades. Mm -hmm. And he wasn't doing any of these things all during that time. It was mm -hmm. only after she betrayed him and ran off with a lover that and also sold all the furniture right. <laughs> left, left him with the kids that he decided you know what have i been holding back for why have i been such a good person um when i really want to act out in these things so it was really pretty late in life that he started um abusing kids and um looking for ways to murder them uh, and he also did like if if he were around today he'd be using the internet um probably going to all kinds of porn sites mm -hmm. and trying to communicate with people because he would write these uh, scatological letters um he was always looking for someone who would would abuse kids with him uh so he could watch and then ha have them also um whip him if you know if, if he could get them to do so 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 he'd be in that sort of craigslist kind of right population looking for somebody to do things to him but he was an interesting mix of sadism and masochism mm -hmm. he really loved pain he loved inflicting it and watching other people scream and writhe around but he also really loved having it done to him and he would find all kinds of things to do to himself like he would light cotton balls that were soaked in alcohol and and stuff them into his rectum what? Um, yeah he he put these needles into his groin and into his testicles um he would put uh, the stem of a rose into his urethra and he would look at himself for hours in the mirror and then he would eat the petals of the rose. So we know that he's a pretty deviant guy. He's he's yeah. very bizarre. One thing he always wanted to do and never just could never get past the pain was to stick needles underneath his fingernails. And he never could quite do that. But he wanted to. That was his big ambition was to be yeah. able to really put himself through some horrible pain. Um, so between... Uh, being a masochist and a sadist, uh, pain was what he lived for. And and in some cases, he would see that as sacrificial, as a way to, because he was all, always thinking about religion. Mm -hmm. So he thought of himself as Christ. He thought of himself as a devil, as Abraham from the Bible. <laughs> he thought he needed to sacrifice virginal kids in order to get to have some redemption or and sometimes he thought of it as saving them from something that might happen to them later uh, he had so many different justifications and he always blamed his faithless wife for getting him started down the path because he said if he had stayed married and she'd stay with him 
he probably would have never done any of these things. Oh, of course, yes. He, he would have been just a pillar of society, I'm sure. Well, it wouldn't have been that, but he said he would have just kept it as a fantasy. And and that isn't necessarily wrong right. because we do have, a, you know, a number of killers who've had very detailed fantasy lives um, who did keep it to themselves. And then suddenly there was an opportunity and they acted out and then found that they liked it and wanted to continue. But had they never had that opportunity, they might never have acted it out. And we don't know how many people, in fact, do have such fantasy lives who never have acted it out. Well, so sure. we can't, we, you can't really say that Fish would never have done that. I think he it's possible he if he'd stayed married, he might have kept it in because he did for a number of years. I think it was something like... 28 when he got married and, mm -hmm. and so so it's got to be into his 40s before he really started acting out like this now you said he had six kids correct right has there been any follow-up with his children to see how they've turned out anything written about them yeah, they were quite surprised about all the things he was accused of because he they said he was uh, he never did anything to them however i mean they were practically starving when the police found them mm -hmm. and you know they he, fish didn't take care of them very well but he didn't abuse them he thought about it he it, it, he had a fantasy about it but it wasn't something that he uh, had ever done that they testified about they mm -hmm. said he was a little weird they'd see him you know whip himself and paddle himself and stand outside naked and say bizarre things but they didn't really um think that they just thought he was a weird eccentric guy <laughs> that's really all they thought and mm -hmm. that's what they testified to during the trial they didn't understand that their father was such a serious violent offender because they had not seen that behavior and interesting that he didn't choose to abuse his own children again knowing how that would turn how that wouldn't turn out well for him at all but let's talk about uh how he went about getting his victims, because this is, again, it's it's just so shocking and so appalling, and, and especially at the end when he wrote letters, and we'll talk about that in a little bit, but do we know anything about his first victim and how he decided to go that route and pick that, that child? We don't know really the whole story of Fish. There's many ideas about how many victims he had, but nobody has proof of when he started, who his first victims were. They likely were kids that he sexually assaulted. Mm -hmm. um, he made claims about castrating some, but I don't, I have never seen re police reports that followed up and found boys who had been castrated. Sometimes it was hard to tell when Fish was just talking about his fantasy life and when he was talking about things that he really did. Um, but we do know that he molested kids. He, d he definitely did that. He actually paid a little girl to bring him um, black kids, and she did. So, oh, you know, he, he has some of that. But he then decided he wanted to, to kill some because he wanted to have them to cut up and, and so he could roast them and cook them and taste them. And so we do have a couple that we knew of, some boys who uh, one went missing mm -hmm. um, and, to, and we didn't know about what happened to him until Fish described it after his arrest. Another was uh, grabbed and abused, sexually assaulted and strangled and found, his body was found. And that was um, 1924. So we, we definitely know about three victims for mm -hmm. Fish. There, there might've been others he was suspected in others. Nothing was proven. And he admitted really only to the three. Mm -hmm. um, but the one that really uh, started it all was the Grace Bud right. case. Right. And so with Grace Bud, I mean, he didn't even, he, it, he wasn't looking for a girl. Mm -hmm. Essentially, Grace's older brother, Edward, had applied a newspaper for a job. And he was looking for some, like a farm job or something. And this is in 1928. And, and uh, Fish answered the ad and, and came to the family, introduced himself, said he was a farmer, 
Um, he had kids and, and he wanted, you know, a young, a, a strapping young guy to help with all of this. And, and mm -hmm. he was going to pay a very good wage. And so he said he would come back and, um, you know, they could make all the arrangements. And so the, when he came back the next time, he had, he had already decided that Edward was bigger than he wanted. Look, he was 18. He was just not exactly what Fish was looking for. But Fish mm -hmm. did come back and visit the family. He sent a telegram ahead to say he was on his way. And he brought um, potted cheese and strawberries with him as gifts. And he's, this is the first time he sees Grace. And she's a, she's a young girl and she comes in and she sits on his lap and she gives him a kiss. And so he persuades Grace's parents to let him take Grace to a birthday party that his sister is giving. And they, they're afraid. They don't want to let their child go off with a strange man, but he's very grandfatherly. Mm -hmm. And they're also afraid that if they say no, that Edward's going to lose this opportunity to have a job. And it was very tough to get jobs. And, they, you know, mm -hmm. he really needed this. So, right. you know, they just, okay, he, what, what harm could there be? And then, of course, Grace disappears. They get the police involved. The uh, address that Fish gave was fake. Um, they couldn't find not only his home address, but the address he said he was taking Grace to. So he had fabricated everything. He mm -hmm. had passed himself off as a Frank Howard. They couldn't find any records on this man. And he'd even taken the copy of the telegram with him. He'd picked it up and, and removed it. However, there was a, the original was still the, telegram op, the telegraph office. So um, they at least had his handwriting sample. Mm -hmm. uh, but that didn't really help with, with very much at the time. And they really had no idea where he went. He had taken Grace on a train. He had hidden the what he called the implements of hell. He had a, a knife, a cleaver, and a saw that he had wrapped up in a burlap bag. And he had hidden them on his way to see the buds. And then he picked them up um, as he was taking Grace. And he knew where he was going because he used to live in this area. Mm -hmm. And he knew that there was an abandoned house in this particular area in the Bronx, and it was called Wisteria Cottage. So he he knew that that's where he was going to take her, where they would be uninterrupted. Um, she thought she was going to the birthday party. In fact, when they got off the train, he had forgotten the bag of, of um, tools. And she said, oh, wait. And she ran back and got oh, his no. bag oh, and no. brought the very tools he was going to use on yeah. her. Uh -huh. um, so he took her to the cottage. He let her play outside while while he undressed and then um, called her in. And then she saw that he was naked. She he had a whole idea of what was going to happen. But she fought mm -hmm. uh, just so t surprisingly. He thought she was a frail little girl, but she she scratched and bit and kicked him. And so what he had in mind, he ended up not doing. Instead, he mm -hmm. just strangled her. Um, and then beheaded her, cut her body in half, uh, and started and took pieces off that he then took home to make into a stew with carrots and you know onions and whatnot. And claimed le later claimed that he had eaten this over the course of nine days in a sexually aroused state. And then he had gone back to Wisteria Cottage. Nobody had been there to get rid of uh, the decomposing body parts that were left behind. He threw them behind a stone wall um, and nobody did find them at all. Through the implements that he'd used in her back there on the stone wall and then he walked away and right. nobody could find this Frank Howard that Fish had, had passed uh -huh. off as for uh, six years. But the investigator, um, mm -hmm. his name was William King, William F. King. He was in charge of the Missing Persons Bureau. And he chased down every lead. And there were multiple leads and many twists in this case. But he used a radio announcer, uh, Walter Winchell. Mm -hmm. And he would feed him information because he he was sure this offender was somewhere around and might be listening to the radio. And so he would 
would feed information to make it sound like they had they had uh, they were closing in they had evidence they knew who they were looking for and uh, at one point um after one of these radio shows uh, the buds received a letter from the person who took their daughter horrific and letter it was a, it was a, a terrible letter is probably high based largely in fish's fantasy mm -hmm. um, we have no I, I doubt that there was any such country that he was talking about where they they cannibalized every kid under the age of 12 i don't think they that. were starving yeah it's a crazy right. letter and we'll, we'll post crazy a letter. letter so you can you can read it and see it's just really awful yeah, yeah it's, it's an it's a it was a terrible it was sh shows the sadistic side of him as he mm -hmm. wanted grace's mother to experience this but what he didn't know she couldn't read Ugh. So Edward read the letter and took it right to the police, right to mm -hmm. King. And uh, so King was able to use this letter because it had been written on a, a particular type of stationery that had been belonged to a benevolent organization. Mm -hmm. So oh, he went he went to this organization and, and it, it matched the handwriting of the telegram that he still had. Mm -hmm. And this was this is um, 1934, so it's six we it's six years and a few months later, so it ma it matches. He thinks he's pretty close to the guy, but he can't find anyone at this benevolent organization that whose handwriting matches. But then he finds a guy who admitted to taking some of the stationery, and he had been at a particular boarding house and had Move left me. the stationery there. So mm -hmm. then <laughs> they looked in the register to see. You know, who who had been in this particular place afterward? They didn't find anything. But then the guy remembered. Oh, there was another boarding house, and that's where they found in the registry handwriting of Albert Fish. Wow! So it wasn't Frank Howard, but it, it was. It, matched, it was pretty close to the handwriting in the letter and in the um, uh, the telegram. Mm -hmm. So. They were. They talked to the landlady, and she said, "Well, he's already gone, but he does come back because his son sends him checks regularly." And he had told me that there's one more coming, so I so he will be back to get that. So King then sat on this, and you know, put surveillance on the boarding house, and and told the post office what letter he wanted to be notified about. The letter finally arrived. But Fish did, didn't arrive. And so King thought, oh, he's gotten word of what we're doing. Mm -hmm. uh, so right. He's not going to show. But they, and it, and it, but a week later, he did show. Oh, and my God. So the landlady notified King, and he came mm -hmm. and uh, arrested Fish and brought him in for interrogation. And so that was how he was caught. And at that point, then, he's he was evaluated by multiple psychiatrists at which point he then confessed to uh, also murdering the the two earlier kids and attempting to murder other kids, but had been interrupted or something mm -hmm. had happened. I think one was a 12 year old girl and one was a 13 year old boy after Grace Bud. But it, he said that, yes, in fact, the letter that he wrote about what he had done to her uh, was all true, although he thought it was quite something that she was a virgin. She had died a virgin because he had not violated her. He had not raped her, though that had been his plan. He was going to do that, but she fought so hard that he finally just killed her instead. But he thought that was a point in, in his favor that she had died a virgin. That yeah. was a big deal to him. And how old was she again? Um, I think she was... 11? Or, yeah, I think yeah. She, yeah, probably 11. Yeah. I can't. And and so we know for sure, or we shouldn't say for sure, but that of four kids that he killed, and he claimed to kill a, a long, much longer list, right? I only know of three that he three? claimed to kill. Okay, three. Yeah. But he didn't he claim to kill a bunch of other kids too? There's a, there's one called Billy Gaffney that he that was the, the missing boy that he mm -hmm. said he had made into a stew. Four um, years was, old. So, yeah, sorry. there was another one, Francis. I remember the first name was Francis. I can't think of the last name. McDonald. Was, yeah, okay, in 1924. I'm not sure who the fourth person is, though. Mm -hmm. uh, no, I just, I, I could be wrong. I, could, I, I only know three. 
Yeah. Well, I I know three and I know that they, and he admitted to attempted murder in a couple of others, um, but got interrupted and they suspected him Mm -hmm. in anywhere from five to 15, but were not able to tie him to it or get confessions to them. Yeah. So was he executed or did he die in prison? What what happened to he him? He went through a trial mm-hmm. and yes, he, he was executed. And again, had anything like this case, because I it's I would assume at the time that this did make the papers and across the nation at this time, do you know if there had been anything like this that had been made public before Albert Fish? Um well, I mean, there had been big cases before mm-hmm. Fish, certainly that had caught in yellow like journalism. A, seri- a serial killer case like yeah, this. Yeah, yellow journalism yeah. had risen yeah. up in the 19th century based mm-hmm. on serial killer cases. So but certainly they, they, were, they didn't call them serial killers, though, did no, they? They didn't call Fish a serial killer. Right. Did they, they weren't using any... the term serial killer until the 1970s and 80s. 70s, really. Yeah. So what did they call him? Just uh, a murder, child killer, just... Yeah, probably. They, they call it, I mean, first of all, when they caught him, they only knew about Grace Budd. Mm-hmm. So he wasn't, it was only when he gave his confessions and he wrote some things up for the newspapers that he, they realized he was, a, they, they called them multicide at the time. So mm-hmm. any anything more than one was multicide, but they didn't really have categories for killers back, back then. then. Right. And, and he definitely was not at first for serial murder Mm -hmm. nor the worst actually i don't think Uh, yeah i was just i was just wondering if he was the first that got a lot of attention for killing multiple children i i mean i don't know i have no idea h.h holmes definitely he killed three children too and that that was covered around the country because Mm -hmm. the detective who was looking for those missing kids was on a journey and Mm -hmm. newspapers one after another in every town that he went in were covering it like it was some kind of, of, you know, cool. Here's, here's where he is today. Here's, where is he going next? Who is he going to find? How's he going to do it? That, I mean, Mm -hmm. that was a very big deal back in the 1890s. Right. And there's a lot of cases like that in the Victorian era. Yes. And there's so many, Trish, I could send you. Oh, no, I believe it. I believe it. The one I'm just most familiar with. Even Belle Gunness, who was caught in 1908. That's the woman, right? Yeah. She's a a pig farmer, and she had murdered and dismembered all kinds of men and Mm -hmm. buried their bodies in her yard or fed them to her pigs. So that was that was certainly before this case. Did she collect their like checks? Was that it? Were they government checks that she would collect? No, no, that that's uh, Dorothy Puente. Okay, I'm get. I see. I'm getting all my killers confused here. I just I can't keep track. No, Bill Gunnis would talk them into take getting all their money, sewing it into their coat, and coming to meet her and telling mm-hmm. nobody where they were. So she we she got their money, but they didn't have government checks or anything. Most of them were Norwegian Americans immigrants. Okay. And so I guess you could say without question that uh, even though true crime is a big form of, I guess, entertainment, you know, hundreds of years ago, it was yellow journalism and people were jumping on it and getting into it just like they are now, but without the internet. In fact, I was just looking up Albert Fish. He was also known as the gray man, the werewolf of wisteria, Brooklyn vampire, moon maniac, and the boogeyman. So yeah, he uh, he certainly did fit the boogeyman part. That's for sure. Well, the boogeyman came from the the missing boy. He was snatched right in front of a friend they were playing, and the friend that said the boogeyman took him. Oh yeah. my gosh! So and yeah, the gray guess- man came from the fact that people saw this little man in the neighborhood where these kids went missing or murdered. And so that's where that nickname came from. Yeah. And there's also, this is fascinating. There's an x-ray of his pelvis and he has more than two dozen self-embedded needles. Yeah. Yeah. Because they didn't believe him when he said that's what he was doing. It was putting these needles in and sometimes he put them in so far he couldn't get them back out. And some were as big as the kind of needle you'd use 
to uh, sew canvas. Mm -hmm. uh, and so they'd stay in there. And when they did the, the x-ray, they found that some had been in there for, were rusting and deteriorating. So probably had been in there for years and they could not understand how he could have stood the pain of that. And he said he also did the same thing to some of the kids that he had abused. Good Lord. Oh, and ladies, I'll tell you what, if this doesn't, I, this, this is what kills me. I guess he was a bigamist. Um, he was married to Estella Wilcox and then, um, for, he was only married to her for a week and but he had been married to another woman i mean you know i guess there's somebody I, with guys guys can always find a woman i swear to god somebody. well well it wasn't that it, i mean he he did not divorce his first wife who ran off with mm -hmm. another man and, right. and they had been married like almost 20 years he just didn't divorce them but he would he took he said he had married these other three women they weren't all at the same time mm -hmm. um two of them denied that they had ever married him so but but yes because legally he was still married that would mean he was um yeah bigamist even mm -hmm. though they it, they weren't all living with him together right no no i yeah i i understand i'm just i'm just kind of commenting on Guys can always find a woman. I swear to God, no matter how 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 disgusting they are, it's just absolutely amazing. So, okay, so he was Albert Fish was uh, grew up in a, an orphanage. We we don't know other than the uh, the pain he saw inflicted by the nuns to the other young boys may have started this uh, down this road, but he didn't start to harm children until he was older like late 20s is i'm going back no, more a little older than that really? older than that because he was married right i think so he was 28 and he didn't do anything until his wife left that that's we know what of. he said that that's know what of. he said i don't know i can't prove anything one way or the other but that's what he said i kind of have a question in regards to his history there yeah um, was it true that he was in the military I don't know. Okay. I can remember reading some kind of reference that he learned to eat meat. It was something about the way he learned to eat meat. And it was some kind of group or military. He was in it for a certain amount of time. And that's where he got the taste for it. I'd have uh, to that he, In his letter to the Buds, he talks about um, the cannibalism. That's, that's where he... Uh, indulged in it but we don't know how much of that is fantasy versus reality mm -hmm. got it and that that's another one i've always thought and you did touch on it i just wanted to clarify um the letters the intention of the letters he wrote to the parents of these children he killed these descriptions he put in the letters obviously are meant to cause them pain so was that him being sadistic causing them pain and he receives pleasure from that well several things are going on i think he only wrote one letter to okay. buds and but he already had been writing these um ads looking for uh people to do things to him like whip him or whip kids and so he could watch or mm -hmm. so he already had been writing these kind of sexually graphic letters and mm -hmm. and ads and so when he sat down to write the one to the buds um i think he that was a, a way for him to relive what had what he'd done to grace but also to inflict pain on the buds and mm -hmm. so he could even though he's not going to be there to watch them open and read the letter he can imagine it right and so yes there's that sadistic element but but also a lot of it is as he's as he's writing it, it's to relive what he did. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. There was a, a letter I thought he'd written where he discussed removing that boy's private part, but it was too chewy, so he threw it away. He didn't eat it. I think that was part of his confession to, wasn't that part of the thing he wrote for the newspaper? Okay. That might be where it is. Yeah, where I don't think he, he gotcha. um, I, I didn't memorize the whole letter. It was a long letter to the buds, and I don't I don't know everything he said in that letter. So yeah. that could have been in that letter, but there's only one letter that I know of associated with him 
that was sent to parents and mm -hmm. it's the one okay. to the buds. So the but he also yeah. but he also gave these confessions to the newspapers after he was caught. Um, and sometimes Jeez. again it wasn't clear what what was real and what was fantasy. Um, and then he also told uh, Wortham, the psychiatrist, a lot of details about what he did. But uh, the mm -hmm. phrase you're referring to could have been in the bud letter, but he did not write to other parents. Okay, okay. so it could have been the confession or or another. Letter. It could have been that, or it could have been that in the letter. bud letter. I don't. Oh, gotcha. I, again, I don't. It's a long letter. It's got yeah. a lot of details about things that he did. Only a, only part of it is about Grace. So. So maybe what you're talking about is from that. I don't know. Yeah. I'd have to reread it. Right. Thank did, you. Did um did the scientific community, the the doctors of the day, did they learn anything from Albert Fish? Or are they able to glean things that perhaps sent them in a different direction on how to treat people? Or was it just not available, that type of information available at that well, time. They, I mean, they certainly learned that they made mistakes in their evaluations of him when they when he was in the hospital during earlier uh, sessions, mm -hmm. and then they let him go and said he was okay. They learned they learned that the facade of being okay is not the same thing as really, you know, being right. normal, right? And that, and that the mistakes have been made, but um, they they were not at the time thinking of what can we do to, how can we use this case to anticipate what could happen mm -hmm. to young children? Nobody was, nobody was doing that at the time. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's hard. I, again, this is just so hard for me to fathom that uh, another human being can do this, but you know, it's been going on probably since the beginning of time. So, uh, and again, true crime, and like you said, yellow journalism at the day for the day was uh, it was based at the turn of the century. Uh, what was it? You, the the name of the was it A.J. Holmes? Was that the uh, name you gave? Or well, H.H. Holmes was one case that got a lot of coverage. Right. There was a one at Theodore Durant in mm -hmm. San Francisco got a lot of coverage of the the two young women. He was a medical student, and mm -hmm. um, the Hearst papers were covering him. Um, there were there were Durant parties. Um, wealthy people could buy seats in the courtroom right next to the judge. It was I mean, it was Whoa. a big deal. It was much bigger deal than what was going on with Bish. Mm -hmm. That's a, see again. It's just it's the same type of mentality, I guess, as to what's going on today, but just yeah. without the internet. You know, without the internet, that is absolutely fascinating. Well, Dr. Ramsland, I can't thank you enough for spending time with us. I have learned so much about this case. And again, everybody, we need to look at the past to see that these, these people, they've always been here and uh, we can learn and hopefully our, our, our medical professionals can, can keep learning from them because they're still out there. And uh, Dr. Ramsland, we're gonna put a link up to your books that are available on Amazon, and I would, uh, all of them are fantastic, but the one you did on the, the BTK, BTK killer was fascinating. Can you just talk a little bit about that? Sure. How uh, you got into it? And Yeah, I spent five years with Dennis Rader, the BTK mm -hmm. killer from Wichita, Kansas. Um, he wanted to, he was interested in working through what he called his dark journey, and so I set it up as what I call a guided autobiography, where what he was going to be thinking about and processing was going to have benefits for criminal justice, criminology, right. and forensic psychology, and law enforcement. That it wouldn't just be him going in whatever direction he wanted to, but it would be guided in a way that would yield things for us. Mm -hmm. um, because I don't think it just left on his own, he could have he could have ever thought about some of the things we ended up doing. Mm -hmm. But it took, you know, it took five years. That's the longest I've ever spent on writing a book. And uh, it was fascinating. Um, I'm, I have to say he worked hard at it. It sometimes took him a long time to read some of the things I sent him. Mm -hmm. But he he did. I, I've been talking to him now for 12 years. Um, I, I continued to speak with him. Um, we, we did a four-part 
documentary for A and E based on the book and on many of the people who were involved. Um, I got to know some of the victims' families, but I didn't really want their story to be alongside his. Right, it's an right. Autobiography, not a biography, and not an investigation book. There are plenty right. of books out there on the BTK investigation. This mm -hmm. is specifically in his voice, uh, his words. Um, sometimes I frame it, uh, but it's really about what was going on with him, what he thought of his victims, what he thought of his crimes. Uh, he had a list of 55 potential projects. So even though he murdered 10 uh, between 1974 and 1991, Mm -hmm. uh, he certainly targeted many others. And wow. so he talks a lot about those in the book. Uh, real quick, uh, did he have anything happen in his childhood or did he just grew up and this came out? Yeah, that's why I wanted to work with him uh, because mm -hmm. he's an outlier. We, we think we have these formulas about <laughs> what happened right. to people who became serial killers. We really don't. First of all, there's over 5,000 documented serial killers, and that doesn't even cover all the ones who've gone undetected or unrecorded. Um, so they each have their own trajectory. And I thought because he he was an all-American boy, with intact family, uh, no abuse, grew up with you know on farms with grandparents, and uh, none of that, none of the stuff we would expect mm -hmm. was true of him. So how could it have happened that he became a serial killer? And that's what I carefully document the various influences and triggers that came mm -hmm. together to the point where he finally acted out. He had a very, very strong fantasy life. He mm -hmm. read about other serial killers. They inflamed his imagination. He wanted to be famous like them and then had an opportunity that he acted on ended up killing four people the first time out without right. intending to. That's just what happened. And when he got away with it, he knew he wanted to keep doing this. So how did he get to that point uh, is what's carefully documented to show the trajectory mm -hmm. uh, of his development so that e even a seemingly normal kid with the right influences or the wrong influences mm -hmm. can become a serial killer and we same could be said for mass murderers and spree killers. Right. so there you have to look at you have to look at how they perceive their world mm -hmm. how they react to things what temperament do they have so it's a mix of biology and environment uh, what what matters to them how do they exaggerate things that happen to them um, like a humiliation for him was a huge deal Mm -hmm. Whereas other kids might just be able to shrug it off. Right. And that's, a, that's a temperament issue. Mm -hmm. um, so um, I think I was, I don't think you could apply what I did necessarily to just any case because he's, he's unique in that respect, but it still helped us to see uh, the seemingly normal kid mm -hmm. grow up to become what is now one of the most infamous serial killers. Exactly. And he had brothers and family members and they all turned out normal. I Pretty guess. much. Yeah. He's the oldest of four boys. Mm -hmm. um, he's uh, one was a bit of a troublemaker, but not on end of the scale. He was by mm -hmm. any means, he was a father of two kids who turned out fine. Um, he was a, active in his church. Mm -hmm. He was what, what he thinks of as a good husband. I, I don't think that's necessarily true, right, but, right. but he thought of himself that way. He held a regular job. You know, we, we often have these formulas that, you know, they live with their mothers. They, they, They're loners. they have menial jobs. They're loners. Right. They have no relationships, blah, blah, blah. Uh, none of that's true of him. With him. That, yeah, it was, very surprising. And again, uh, I would recommend, I'm sure you can get it on Amazon. We'll find a link to it because I, I would highly recommend that book for okay. everybody. Yeah, Dr. Amsland, thank you so, so much. I, I hope you will come on again because I I know Stacy and I could sit here and not that you would uh, 
actually want to do this, but we could talk to you for like eight hours straight <laughs> without stopping. So, yeah. <laughs> then I wouldn't be able to write. That's yeah. true. Oh, like, no. Right. And, and actually, I mean, you might mention how to catch a killer because the fish story is in so, there. Oh, yeah. how to catch a killer. Okay. And we'll find that link too. make sure we get it. How to catch a killer and the BTK autobiography. We will make sure those links are up there along with all of your other books that are still in print, and hopefully all of them are, because I'm sure they're not all. <laughs> not all. Well, I've been writing for over 35 years; they're not all in print. Okay. And well, the ones that are in print are fascinating. I am sure. Yes, my dear. The Psychology of Death Investigations. That's the first one I want to get. Okay. Uh, that one, yeah, that's my the textbook I wrote for a course I teach called Psychological Sleuthing. Wonderful. Oh wow! I want that one. I will get that for your birthday. I promise. Yes. <laughs> Dr. Ramslin, thank you so, so much. You've done a, a great deal to help us understand and to help everybody understand the minds of these people. And uh, anything we can do for you, don't hesitate to call, okay? Well, thank you. I appreciate it. Take care. Thanks, Thanks for again me. for your time. All right. Bye -bye. Oh, there we go. Hey, okay. We're back. We're back. Did you guys like that? Wasn't she great? Oh my gosh. She was fantastic. And I want to show you a picture. Uh, she was talking about Albert Fish, how he stuck all these pins in his abdomen. I want to show you the x-ray that she was talking about. Okay. I've got it right here. Or I did. No, I no. Wait a minute. I know where I have it. I actually got it right here to put up. Hang on. Look at that. Yep. Look at that. Gaze upon that while I go let the animals in. I saw that um, x-ray when I was eight years old. And I, when I was reading, what I read is he used to, he had a paddle. He'd put nails in it. And he'd go outside naked under the full moon and spank himself with the nails. Then And the nails stuck out. So they'd puncture him. And there I am at eight years old, just like. Didn't that scar oh, you for life, though? My didn't God. My Surprisingly, life. it didn't. But not, not that you know of yet. <laughs> but yeah. A lot of life but in there. I was eight years old trying to figure out. And that's immediately when I learned about sadists. Mm -hmm. Was from that. I just, yeah. I, look at, I mean, imagine doing that to yourself over and over and over. I just, Crazy. It's insane. Okay, I'll, I'll remove this now. And I will get the links to those books uh, from Dr. Ramsland as soon as we're done here. I One thing I didn't get around to. I'm so sorry. So let's see where I'm I'm doing the brand. Yeah, there we go. And I can remember, uh, I'm glad she said it because I was pretty sure I read this when I was a kid too, was that when they, Fish and Grace were on the bus that he'd left his box of implements there and she had ran back and got him for him and dr ramsland confirmed girl. my memory yep she was a sweet little girl and that That'd is helpful uh, that just it made my heart stop when she said that yeah. it really did it was awful okay but you have an albert fish story that you've been holding back on us tell us well actually this occurred recently there's not much to it but um as you can imagine in my household my kids were raised learning about crime Your just crime, like crime. i was raised that way right so my oldest son's 31 and he lives back east and um he met a few months ago through a mutual friend of his he met a, a another somebody his age mm -hmm. i don't know if his age or how old the guy is actually and he was talking to my son and then my son found out he's a grandson of albert fish oh my god and of course, my son immediately knew who Albert Fish was. Well, of course, of like every so, <laughs> child of yours should. Yes. Yeah, that's my daughter says I'm morbid. I don't no. know. No, <laughs> yeah. silly girl. Yeah, so he calls me and he's all, "Mom, my God, guess what?" And he's all, "I met one of Albert Fish's grandsons," and I said, "Oh my God, you know, well, how is he?" And he said, "Oh, he's so messed up." Oh, really? And I said, "Do you think he'd talk to me about it?" 
and he's all, I don't know, he's really messed up. He's for some, it's really affected him. Oh no. Yeah. Well, so I might grandson. try talking to him. Yeah. You did talk to him or you didn't? No, I'm going to talk to my son again about talking to him. Yeah. Because, yeah. you know, I mean, he could even come on the show and we can show him all kinds of love and sympathy. I'm serious. That might help him. Yeah, mm -hmm. and it, it's not his fault no, at all. Not at all. But my gosh, can you imagine? You're just, you know, that's your grandfather. Yeah, my you grand have yeah. guilt from things like that. You know, even though you had nothing to do with it. Right. I wonder if he actually knew him. How old was he? The the. I'll I'll ask my son. Yeah, I'll find out. it'd be interesting to see if he actually knew him. Bug, bug a bug. Othram text Bug Nugget the first. Young man, get over here. Come on. Good boy. Look what I got. Ooh, it's a big chewy gunky look that you're chewing on. It's one of those bone thingies. Okay. So anyway, um, yeah, it's I you would think his grandson it would have like stopped. But obviously, right. you know. You can only imagine, especially if, like, when he was growing up, it, growing up, if kids knew his who his grandfather was, mm -hmm. and, and especially if he knew him, you know, if he met him as a little kid. I yeah. mean, yeah, I can see how that would mess you up. I, I absolutely can. Yeah, well, especially if see, you're somebody with a conscience, you know, you feel yeah. bad for things that aren't your responsibility. Exactly. And he obviously, the fact that he feels bad, he's one step way ahead of Albert because he has feelings. Exactly. And like Tiger Lily 81 says, he needs to know he doesn't have to bear that shame. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. We'd love to have him on. I, you know, just to, just to let him know that anybody in the real world would not ever think anything poorly of him. Right. You know? God, yeah. my, my relatives are nuts, man. They're just, you know, go down the line, they get crazier and crazier. So, but Hey, you know, it's fun. It's fun coming from crazy. Look at me. How could, how could anyone want not want this, you know? Uh, oh, you're Kibby, you're not going to have bad dreams. I promise. I promise. But speaking of tonight, don't forget Woo Woo Saturday night. The Thoris is coming on to show, for, well, to tell us first about the um, painting. Remember, she had that painting that she purchased from an antique store, like an antique in a mall type thing. And she brought it home. Too many weird things were happening. They found a human tooth in the frame of the painting. And so she took it back and the guy didn't want it back. They took it to a medium and the medium gave her some information. So she's going to come on tonight and talk about that. And then the Thoris and her husband make these really cool, like leather masks. Think of, um, think of like, I, I think this design was actually made during the plague time. It would be a yes, the plague yeah, mask, the yes. plague mask. And Oh my gosh, it's some cool stuff. And then I've got a really cool picture of the latest fountain that I Hate Chocolate uh, made as well. So we'll do that. It'll be like a little crafty thing after Woo Woo tonight. So get your ghost stories ready, your paranormal, whatever. We'll be here at 1030 Eastern. Insightful One, I'll leave you with the last word. What's going on in your life? What do you want to say? No, <laughs> I, I said that you're right tonight. on the spot. Put you on the spot. I'm, sorry, I'm, I'm really looking forward to tonight to hear about the Thoris is painting. Yeah, that's going to be really good. Really, really good. And thanks to everybody in chat. I appreciate you showing up. We had a special time here today and we're going to do these things every once in a while, just kind of spring them on you. So, okay. See everybody tonight, 1030 Eastern for Woo Woo Saturday night on Web Sleuth YouTube live. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.